Um, let me first uh, load up. Hopefully that doesn't contribute to the talk time. Um, uh, Windows. Um, okay. Full screen. Um, um, where is full? Oh, control. Oh. Uh, Bokertov. Um, today, I'd like to generally talk about simulations of tidal disruption, and then our current work done with collaborators Hotika Shiokawa, Julian Krolik, uh, Svi Peron, Gilad Svirsky, and Scott Noble. Let's look at the classic picture. Um, a star orbiting a black hole will come in and reach a distance known as the tidal radius and disrupt. Uh, if this star is on a parabolic orbit, then some of the debris is ejected out of the system while the rest returns to the black hole around the tidal radius. Um, the, the debris that first returns will have a semi-major axis A min, which is proportional to the mass ratio between the black hole and the star. And it will return on a time scale tau, which is the orbital period of the, uh, of the semi-major axis of this most bound debris. In the traditional model, this disk will quickly form and have the geometry of roughly the tidal radius. Um, this means that when it returns, debris will quickly circularize um, and have an accretion time scale, which is much smaller than the period of first return, tau. We, you're, you're telling my story. <laughs> um, we, we got it. Okay, in fact, oh, well, right, okay. So, um, so good question to ask. What's, once we've assumed these things about quick circularization, um, what, is, what is the return rate of debris when it first returns? If we assume that these are ballistic debris, that it returns ballistically, um, and if we know what the distribution of orbital energy of the debris is, and if we know Kepler's third law, we can find this rate. Um, if we know, so given the distribution of mass and energy, um, if we find that it's flat, like Evans and Kachanik did, and if we use the chain rule properly, as Stirl Finney did, we find that the fall off is t to negative 5 thirds for the return rate. Um, if we jump and say what the luminosity is, if it's equal to this return rate, we find that it should be proportional to t to negative 5 thirds. Okay, so what we have is a paradigm that the accretion flare for a TDE should fall off as t to negative 5 thirds. We should ask some hard questions, I guess. Um, where does this come from? Well, as I said earlier, it assumes quick formation at around RT. Um, and we say that the accretion rate is equal to the return rate, then it's proportional to t to negative 5 thirds. If we assume that this is a radiatively efficient disk, then we have that the luminosity is proportional to t to the negative 5 thirds. But, Mushune, this means that for 10 to the 7 solar mass black holes, this should be highly super Eddington, that the peak should be highly super Eddington, which is, conflicts with assuming efficient radiation. So, um, the, uh, discuss, uh, generally, uh, or let me try, I should say, um, so can a black hole accrete super in, in a super Eddington way? This is open for discussion. Uh, there's a debate in simulations between um, Yan Fei Zhang and Sadovsky, uh, Oleg Sadovsky. So this is an open question. So another question. Um, where does the light come from? And at what wavelength? We don't really know. And how do jets form from TDEs? So, so how do we address these big problems? We answer simpler problems. Uh, well, so one question to ask is, what is the geometry of these disks? Um, arguments for, you know, if we consider loss cone and rates arguments, they say that tidally disrupted stars are likely to be on marginally bound orbits. 
So in recent simulations by Guilashan et al. and Shiokawa et al., from disruption to the uh, disk formation, um, a star was modeled on a parabolic orbit and disrupted by a uh, black hole of 10 to th roughly 10 to 3 solar masses. Uh, the initial orbit was at E equals 1, so eccentricity of 1. Um, also, the semi-major axis of the bound debris is roughly 5 times the tidal radius. These are geometrically different from simu simulations with bound orbits. Uh, there have been recent simulations done by Bonnerey et al. and Hayasaki et al. with a mass ratio of about 10 to the 6, uh, eccentricity less than 1, and the semi-major axis of all of the debris is roughly 1 to 5 or 1 to 10 times the tidal radius. Do you show the simulation to accretion, though? We do not do regularization, but there's right. simulation of the 10 to 6. Right. Right. You do the 10 to 3, you show the disk formation. Or, right. Okay. So, for these bound orbit simulations, the tidal streams are close to the initial orbit. So some already have semi-major axis on the order of RT. Also for these simulations, the stream intersection angle is much larger than those for parabolic orbits. So this means that circularization is just easier to do. So these are geometrically different uh, simulations. So for the remainder of this talk, I will focus on the accretion problem for disruptions on parabolic orbits. In the classical picture, <coughs> debris will, when it first returns, it'll focus at periasterin producing shocks, known as the nozzle shock, and also shocks will occur with relativistic precession at the tidal radius. However, uh, Kachanik showed uh, semi-analytically that this nozzle shock is inefficient. Um, with 3D Newtonian hydrodynamic simulations, Guila Sean et al. showed that it's also inefficient. And then more recently in Shiokawa et al., uh, the shocks at peri periasterin, as well as shocks when the stream intersects show are, are not efficient enough with 3D GR, uh, GR hydrodynamic simulations. And so, as it stands, the shock at periasterin are not efficient enough to circularize material, and we have that the accretion time scale is not smaller than the period of first return for the debris. Okay, well, hopefully I've shown and argued for uh, the thought that detailed calculations of the accretion process are necessary. This is a very messy problem. It involves hydrodynamics, gravity, magneto, or magnetic fields, and radiative transfer. Um, I stress that the choice of initial conditions is very important, particularly for the initial orbit, but also stellar structure is important. So even with hydrodynamics and gravity, this is very, very computationally expensive. And this expense increases with mass ratio. So um, uh, most previous work on parabolic disruptions have a moderate uh, black hole to star mass ratio. And over the years, we have been able to, to model a fraction of this fundamental time scale, the return time. Uh, from a fraction to about ten, to, to over 10 times tau. So, and now we'll show how we cut down the expense in Shiokawa et al. So we modeled the disruption, uh, we modeled the, the system from disruption by a non-spinning black hole and then its evolution of the debris streams around the black hole. We did this first by modeling disruption in a local moving frame following the star, known as Fermi normal coordinates. Then we take the result of that simulation as initial conditions for uh, evolution in the black hole domain. So here's a schematic of the results of our simulation, showing shock formation and angular momentum redistribution. Debris first returns to the black hole, then as debris 
the stream, debris stream is focused at periastin, there is the nozzle shock that forms. And after the stream wraps around the black hole, it'll intersect with the incoming stream and hit itself. And when this happens, shocks also form there. And in this process, some debris is deflected into the black hole, and that's roughly 30% of the bound mass. We have this disk that forms roughly on the scale of Amen, the semi-major axis of the most bound debris. Later in time, the geometry of the disk changes as it continues to hit itself. We see that in this process, the angular momentum distribution broadens. So does the debris circularize? Well, not really. So just to give you an idea, this is uh, our initial condition, the distribution of, of angular momentum versus energy from the local calculation. Its corresponding distribution and eccentricity is here, where we start the global simulation at 0.6 tau, and it's in the black line. And then we see as it evolves in tau that the eccentricity decreases, but the median is still at a 0.4. So we are not getting it to be E equals zero, even at the end of our simulation. So now let's talk about accretion rates. Well, we like to actually say mass accumula accumulation rate instead of accretion rate. We don't know how things super identically accrete on the black hole very well. So we show this in two ways from our simulation. So this is a mass accumulation rate versus tau. Um, we first show the actual rate of debris as it passes through our inner boundary condition at 30m. Here we see this, this curve comes from the 30% of the bound mass that enters our inner boundary condition at, at the end of the simulation, that 12 tau. Then later we extrapolate with what is remains in our simulation and we extrapolate what the accumulation rate is from analytic theory, where we assume that angular momentum transport <coughs> comes from magneto rotational instabilities and we choose two alpha parameters. Um, and note that the fall off in this, in this rate uh, depends on details of magnetohydrodynamics. So these are rough estimates. So um, we take these curves and compare them with the ballistic return rate. And we see first that the peak is, is 10 times less. We also see that the peak is delayed and is flatter. Instead of about a one, one to two, the peak is around three to eight. Your boundary condition, right. 30M, 30RG. Okay, so to summarize these recent results, uh, we find that the characteristic length scale for a disk to form is at Amin, which is much greater than the tidal radius. We find that in addition to the shock of the nozzle, there are also outer shocks when the debris stream intersects itself. And we find that this, these outer shocks are due to relativistic effects. We find that 30% of the bound mass is deflected into the hole by hitting when the stream hit itself. We find that the remaining mass takes much longer to, accre uh, to, to accumulate onto the black hole. Uh, we find that the peak is 10% less than the classical expectation. So we expect significant departures from the classical expectation for the light curve. And more on that, see Gilad Zierski's talk. This is from our simulation with the uh, 10 to the roughly 10 to the 3 solar mass black hole. I'm not sure what Gilad's going to talk about, but I know that he's going to talk about the outer shocks. When you say deflected into the hole, you mean deflected into the 30 RGs, there, right? Right. A deflected, the, the accumulation is calculated at the inner boundary condition at 30 RG. All right, so that's a summary of our recent work. But here we have current, we're currently working on 
a new method to model the tidal disruption of a star and its accretion flow. We're using a method known as the multi-patch method, which where basically we run multiple simulations at once with different patches. Each patch has a different computational domain size and, and can have different physics and different time steps. The communication infrastructure was written by Hotaka Shiokawa. So we're going to use this big tool to model tidal disruption simulations, um, you know, particularly with the self-gravity of the star in the disruption phase. This tool is used, will be used to treat the problem with magnetic fields from disruption to the accretion flow and also crank up the, the mass ratio. Let me show you a quick example, um, just a test problem to show the multi-patch method. So here we have um, two patches, Cartesian and Minkowski space. Uh, the local patch has a higher resolution than the global patch. Um, here we are going to show um, a gas blob moving at a velocity in the x-direction. Um, on the top, we will show that the patch moves with the gas. And at the bottom, we're going to have just the patch being stationary. So we'll see that the top part, the patch follows the star, whereas the bottom, we're showing how the interpolation between the high resolution local patch moves with the global patch, or interpolates onto the global patch. So. OK. And so. Uh, Right, okay, so, so this is just a teaser. So we were already working on the actual simulation of disruption, but we'll just show you the star warping. But uh, this gives you an idea of our domain, um, which we are, yeah, so which we have. So here's the local patch, that's the global patch, and here's the star being tidally warped before passing periasterin. Okay. Uh, Ta-da. So this is the eccentricity of all of debris in the domain at the beginning of our simulation, right after the local simulation calculates disruption. And so all of this is highly eccentric. It's at 0.8, uh, at, at, at the least at 0.8 to 1. And it's just over time, it's just the, the shocks are not efficient enough. And so we have that it, it lowers in eccentricity, but it's still at 0.4. Well, so in the classical theory, this should happen at, 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 at 1 tau. And so we've already modeled it at 10 tau. Tau is the return, the return period for the debris. So it takes the, most bound, the energy of the most bound debris, and it's the orbital time scale for that energy. Uh, this, is, this is from a parabolic disruption. So, right. Well, you say that. So let's just take the ballistic return rate, which is that the, the actually calculates the return rate. So at about 1.2 or 2 tau, most of the debris should have already returned. So. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, right. I don't have it on this computer. Uh. Right, and the, the debris eccentricity is already really low. Exactly. So I, I think the bigger effect is that the self-intersection is forced to occur at a very small rate. At, at a small right, and at 90 de rough, almost 90 degrees for some cases. Um, often, often at large angles, but I think the bigger effect is just GM overall, the, the available aerial energy in the, in, in the shocks, which can change by orders of magnitude. And the, the key thing here is that that self-intersection radius is a fairly steep function of the pericenter in dimensionless Showed and as you as you move to, to larger 
larger RP over RG ratios, the self-intersection gradient moves very far out. So in, in the Shiokawa et al. simulations, I, I believe the RP over RG was 100, whereas for realistic tidal disruptions around, say, 10 to 7 solar mass molecules, it might be more like 10 or 15. And I think that would force a, a much closer self-intersection point, which would give much more efficient dissipation. Right, but I mean, we won't really know unless we actually do the simulation. Of course. I should I, also I say that. that the eccentricity for, 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 for the debris for these parabolic orbits are much closer to, to, to one for increase in mass ratio. So we are actually showing debris, we're showing a simulation that has debris with a lower eccentricity. Do you know what that rate is? So it's a function of the uh, RP over RT. Well, do you know if it's efficient enough to lose all that orbital energy? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. We've done test cases looking at the cell intersection point as a function of um, RP over RT. And it's true that when RP over RT gets down to the first tenet, then the astronomical perspective breaks down. And you do have a So we, we do need, we can make estimates, but we need details. Right. So I just think the stream collision aspect. Right. I but think that part is actually reasonably predictable. Right. But we need to know things like what, where does the, the photons come out and what wavelength. Thought of everything. Right. It, it all depends on, um, I guess, uh, how much material gets pulled off if you have some star with a denser core, the, the time for, for being stripped off is different, so. Um, there's, there's only a finite number of stellar types in the world that exist. So is, is that a route to actually mapping out the distribution of stars in the center of uh, It's possible. It's actually, if, you, if you want to, I guess, look at some changes to the return rate, there's actually a paper by Guilashan et al. that shows this. Um, the return rate changing for stellar structure. So, but, um, but it's possible. We just have mostly modeled polytropes. Open question. So, uh, why is it then that so many of the observations are showing at late times the 
the delay curve is following something close to the classical prediction of the Q to the minus 5 third. <coughs> the debris is having such a hard time um, particularizing. Well, it depends on how many points you have and what the bolometric corrections are. I'm, I'm not an observer, but um, this is what we have, what the physics shows. So we have um, an estimate of, well, I don't have it here, but we have a figure in the paper that shows the angular momentum distribution uh, with the debris as a function of time, like we showed for the eccentricity. And we can go over that, but um, right, so uh, later, I guess. So you asked w what the... I think whether the mass that can be or uh, inner boundary. Right. Does it have enough angular momentum to go in a circle or orbit? With it for, <coughs> does it fall I think, I think uh, so I don't know the numbers. I think what we found that it would go into the hole, but it's possible that it can also hit other debris and come out, but I don't really know. The MHD, right. Right, so we cut off at r uh, at r equals 30m, and you know, we we can't estimate anymore because we don't know the physics. If we use the ballistic rate to see what it was, I mean, it won't be much better than what we have right now. We we can look at the plot. people's heads off. Just think, just think the first part of that and then show, like really <laughs> French. So Clement could probably tell me how to do it better. I've been corrected by French people on my own last name. Do <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. you think we can move this? Uh, Uh, okay, so first I wanted to uh, commend Svi on a very clever name for the circularization. So I googled uh, Jerusalem bagel just to see what they look like. I've never been here before. and I think it's actually a really good food, as best of a food descriptor 
of TDEs that you can come up with. Um, but, but I wanted to make one comment, which was that I think for so far for now, we haven't focused too much on what happens when we exceed Eddington. Um, and including the radiation physics, I think, is one of the harder things to do. And so uh, Eric Coughlin with Mitch Begelman had a paper on zebras. So I think if you wanted an inclusive model to account for the sub and super Eddington, it should really be the Jerusalem Begelman model. I think that'll be a little bit more inclusive. So <laughs> I can see Svi uh, kind of giving a half smirk. So maybe. <laughs> uh, OK. Um, so uh, I'll be talking about today, uh, I think, an aspect of the problem that no one else has uh, done quite yet. Uh, which is to include magnetic fields in the star originally being disrupted and just trying to figure out if that has any dynamical effect on the disruption and the consequences of including a magnetic field in the star to begin with. Um, I think rightly so, most of us focus on the circularization afterwards because that's what produces all of the light. Um, but this actually has uh, implications for jet formation because you may be starved of flux, which is necessary to produce the jet. Uh, and it also could uh, have implications for the magnetic fields of stars that are partially disrupted by black holes. Uh, in principle, this process could lead to an amplification, which could give you stars that are highly magnetized if they've encountered the black hole previously. Um, so this work was done primarily with uh, Mike McCourt, who's now at uh, Santa Barbara and was my office mate last year. Uh, so. The brief outline, I'll just talk about magnetic fields and stars really briefly. Um, I'll do a tiny overview of tidal disruptions, even tinier here because everyone knows what I'm talking about, hopefully. Um, I'll talk a little bit about magnetic fields and why you should care, and I'll show you some preliminary results. Okay, so magnetic fields and stars are typically very weak. It's something like one millionth of equipartition in something like the sun. Um, the sun is our best laboratory for studying magnetic fields because we see uh, very high resolution pictures of its surface, all these prominences, and um, we also can do very detailed asteroseismology on the sun. Uh, but we really can't probe very deeply into the sun's structure to figure out what the internal magnetic field looks like in a great uh, level of detail. We have some idea for how the sun is, um, uh, its internal motions are going from the asteroseismology, but the magnetic fields are carried along by those motions, and it might result in a very complicated structure that uh, I think it's pretty much only known by looking at computer simulations of such stars. Uh, so that's true. Yes, yes. So in giants, actually giant stars being disrupted, uh, this has perhaps huge implications, especially since they're more magnetic. And because there is a possibility that a giant star could have um, formed the streamer that G2 is a part of in principle. So. If that were the case, the magnetic field configuration inside that debris could be very important. Uh, so this is just showing some examples of magnetic field configurations in some magnetic, more main sequency type stars. Um, so this is an example of magnetic uh, subset of A stars called AP stars. Uh, they have very large um, convective flows, roughly star scale. Uh, and you get this sort of tangled spaghetti-like spaghetti structure inside the star. Uh, not really a strong dipole component, uh, very mixed. Um, other people have done simulations of these, um, found uh, even larger scale helical twists in these fields. Um, and this is sort of an ongoing uh, area of study. So I don't think people have really converged on what the magnetic structure really is, but these are what the simulations are showing. And they're very interesting. Um, Another uh, example is uh, of a rapidly rotating sun-like star. So this could be something like the sun shortly after it um, gets onto the main sequence and still has a significant amount of rotation. There you get these uh, giant wreaths of counter-directional uh, magnetic fields on the north and south um, above the equator in the star. Uh, so very fascinating internal magnetic field structures you can get. But the point was just to show that there, you can get variety. And you can also have in irrotational stars something that vaguely resembles a dipolar configuration interior, interior as well. Uh, but the real answer is that we don't really know for a large fraction of stars what this looks like. Uh, 
So there's really kind of two flavors for currently magnetic stars. There are those where the fields are generated by internal motions and actively sustained by those internal motions. So that could be protostars, AP stars, dwarf stars, red giant stars. Um, or they had large internal motions in the past and those fields are now frozen in. So they're sort of relic fields from a time when you actually had significant motion in those objects. Uh, so that would be magnetic white dwarfs or magnetars. Uh, interestingly, from uh, this review paper on magnetic fields and stars by Rice and Nager in 2009, the maximum flux value for all stellar types is 10 to the 27.5 Gauss centimeters squared. So that's, that number is the same for the most magnetic magnetars as the most magnetic red giant stars. And uh, it's a very interesting um, value. Okay, so Tau's reference to brief, star passes by the black hole gets tidally destroyed. Uh, the only reason why I want to show you this slide is that in some cases, if the tides are weak, you can get a surviving core in the center, even if you remove something like 50% of its mass. Uh, and those encounters are more common, uh, not just because uh, they happen further away from the black hole where the rates of disruption are a bit higher, but because you probably get multiple encounters per star when this occurs. It'll run by the black hole several times, each time losing a little bit of mass. Um, so this is a simulation, pure hydro, just showing a partial disruption of a star. Uh, just to give you an idea of what this looks like. You get your two tails that are launched out. Uh, the core experiences some decompression during a uh, pericenter approach, but then recollapses, and then actually starts to pull in uh, these uh, arms back onto itself and re-accrete some of its own matter. So you end up with this uh, actually highly turbulent, um, rapidly rotating core. Uh, and if you also notice is that the streams are not feeding directly onto the core, they're kind of offset. So it has significant angular momentum. And uh, if you look, you can see these sort of spiral shocks moving out. It's a little hard to see um, with the light level. But that's actually a redistribution of angular momentum. Oh, you can see it over there, great. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think one of those switches was the projector, because now, okay. <laughs> yes, okay. I can probably disconnect and reconnect if it's the projector on. Yeah. I think the projector is actually powered off. Great. Then we have to wait for this to warm up. <laughs> I remember Elliot Quater came to Santa Cruz when we had a power outage during the middle of his talk. And he just started pantomiming in front of the audience. He was doing some sort of magnetic instability thing. It was, it was pretty entertaining. So I might start spinning around soon. <laughs> yeah, so these, these lights now are like directly illuminating the screen. That's why it's not very visible. <laughs> All right, well. Okay, this would work, but I'm calling someone. Yeah. Okay. Well. So now we're going to look at a full disruption, which will go a lot faster just because I didn't dump out so many frames here. But um, just very simple. It just gets obliterated and uh, stretched into a, uh, an elongated stream whose width is uh, controlled by self-gravity, surprisingly enough. Uh, OK, so why should you care? Uh, so I kind of mentioned this in the intro. We could potentially amplify the magnetic fields in partially disrupted stars. Um, we want to know if we can deliver enough flux to the black hole to power the jets. Um, and 
if that's the case, or even if that's not the case, are interested in what is the structure of the magnetic fields that actually feed the black hole post-disruption. Uh, so the idea was to kind of characterize uh, what happens in a disruption for a few examples, a few different internal magnetic field configurations uh, to see if we can get the answers to those questions. And it would be valuable information for people who are mapping their initial conditions into these uh, circularization calculations. Okay, so my uh, code of choice is Flash, which is my bread and butter for the past uh, several years. Uh, the solver that I'm utilizing is an unsplit staggered mesh solver utilizing constrained transport. Uh, so the big problem that a lot of numerical codes have is conserving uh, Maxwell's simplest equation, which is that div b equals zero. Um, in SPH codes in particular, this is very difficult to do. Uh, seems like the lights are off now. So yeah, that's good. Um, So because I believe in exposing one's dirty laundry, uh, I'll say that Flash does obey this expression to uh, numerical precision when you don't use the refinement operations in the calculation. The refinement is supposed to conserve div b, but there's some sort of very subtle bug where every once in a while when you de-refine a block, it will spuriously generate some div b. It's fairly small, maybe 10 to the minus 3, the field strength. Um, and when you have very large divergence areas, you can visibly see it in the flow. Like you can see the field lines getting trapped on um, these artifacts. Um, but the current workaround is really to just de-refine as little as possible. And I'm trying to work with the flash people to try and resolve that. That being said, um, it is small. And actually, a lot of the other methods I'll talk about have order unity errors and divergence. Uh, OK. So the initial conditions, we have a partial disruption and a full disruption. So beta 0.7 and 1.5, polytropic index, three halves, uh, which is uh, approximately a fully convective star. Uh, we see the magnetic field via its vector potential because we can ensure that at least the initial conditions have no divergence. Uh, the star initially has 100 cells in diameter. Uh, we start out with a very strong magnetic field uh, for something like the sun, uh, mega gauss fields, um, simply because we didn't want the uh, beta value to be too extreme, uh, the magnetic beta. Um, and uh, we also only define the field within the star, just because the alphane speed in the vacuous fluff you have to place outside of the star would be really huge if you placed it there. Uh, OK, so I'm going to show you another movie. This is, again, a partial disruption. This one has magnetic fields in it. Uh, so this is just showing you the density again. And on the surface, it doesn't look tremendously different from the other simulation, which was slightly different conditions anyway. Um, but uh, inside, there is a tangled magnetic field, uh, which looks like this. So uh, it is intensity. So magenta is the most intense magnetic fields. And I think blue is the least intense magnetic fields. It goes from mega gauss for the magenta to maybe 100,000 Gauss for the blue. So the way we initialize it is that we maintain the same magnetic energy fraction throughout the star. So on the surface, it has weaker fields than it does in the core. Um, and that is a bit of an arbitrary choice, because in real stars, it does vary as a function of radius. Um, so this is just showing a movie of what's going on with the magnetic field inside that star when it is disrupted. Uh, so if you look closely, you can see that there are these two vortical structures that form uh, shortly after the disruption when the core recollapses. Uh, so you can see them kind of there and there on both sides. And I'll pause it now. So uh, those two vortexes last roughly a dynamical time, so maybe one orbital period of the surviving core. And you'll notice two things. One is that inside the core, things look fairly tangled aside from those two <laughs> large vortical structures. Uh, but in the arms, you can see that the field lines are very, very straight. They've straightened out quite a bit. And the initial magnetic field configuration was totally random relative to the direction the star came in at periapse. So despite that, you don't see much of an imprint of that randomness in the arms. 
Uh, and in density, you can see that these vortexes are actually two under densities within the structure of the star that are really, really quite low relative to the core. Um, so really, the, the uh, star kind of deforms into a double hold donut uh, during this phase. Uh, so why do you see that field straightening in the arms when um, you see it just tangling up in the center? Well, it's just a simply flux conservation. So uh, the star is being primarily stretched in one direction. Uh, so the cross-sectional area through the star is remaining roughly fixed. So the amount of flux going through that area is remaining roughly fixed. So the magnetic field strength is not changing very much for field lines that are parallel to the direction of stretching. For field lines that are perpendicular to the direction of stretching, you're taking the same flux and you're stretching it out through a much larger area. So what ends up happening is that the field is tangled, but the components that are perpendicular to the stretching are being degraded significantly. So then when you look at the flux after the disruption, all you see is the parallel component. Uh, so this is what the field geometry looks like in the star after it's sort of in this elongated um, case. So this is a fully destroyed star now. Uh, so the top is the top view and the uh, bottom is the side view of these fields. So we'll just scroll past what that looks like. Uh, so very, very straight, stretched and elongated uh, along the direction of stretching. Uh, and that's pretty interesting, I think. Because remember, we started out with random initial conditions. Uh, it could have very well been the case that the field lines were perpendicular to the direction of stretching, which would be uh, interesting, I think, if you're interested in powering a jet. Okay, so just a schematic uh, showing this. So in a partial disruption, that core is twisting around. It's pulling in matter from those two arms that are accreting onto the core, uh, and it ends up giving you a very tangled, twisted field. For the full disruption, it's pretty boring. It just sort of stretches and um, takes the field and uh, exaggerates it in that direction. Uh, so this is now showing magnetic beta. Uh, white is basically gas pressure dominated. Black is magnetic dominated. Uh, so if you look at this movie, uh, you can see how tangled the structure is uh, inside the star. You also notice that inside the star, the magnetic field is not dominating um, the gas pressure in most places. It's still pretty white. Uh, actually, black is where they're equal to one another. In the arms, however, you can see that it's completely black. So the magnetic field is starting to dominate in the arms, resulting from the tidal disruption. So I'll just show this one more time. If you pay attention to the arms, you can watch them change color. They go from sort of a orange red to a dark black. Yes? That's right. Um, does it, go it does go a little bit, um, I guess, super virial in terms of the magnetic field strength, maybe a factor of 10 times larger. Um, it does become magnetically dominated. The reason for it is that as you stretch the star, it adiabatically degrades the internal energy, but the magnetic field strength is not going down. So that's basically what happens. So uh, now we'll just show a uh, CAT scan through this, uh, through this star. So this is basically showing you field going out of the page and into the page as uh, red and blue colors, respectively. Uh, so what you'll notice is that it does have a relatively complicated cross-section. It kind of looks like a face. Um, the reason for that, that's related to basically the random parallel component to the stretching. Because remember, we started with a random field. And roughly, you can see that there's just as much flux going into the page as out of the page. Uh, so what this really is, is a giant loop. It's a giant field loop that stretches from the core all the way to the tip of the stream and back. And if you remember the elongated stream I showed you before, that was basically the structure. Uh, this is the top-down view of what the uh, the perpendicular component of the field looks like after the disruption. So you can see quite a bit of substructure, lots of reversals of the field. Uh, okay, so now let's uh, compare. So we're showing now a difference between a pure hydro and a field with, uh, and a run with magnetic fields included. Uh, the one with the slightly fatter streams is the ones with the magnetic field included. Uh, so what you can notice is that actually the inclusion of the magnetic fields gives you an additional pressure component, which causes the streams to be a little bit wider than they would have been with the neglect of that particular contribution. Uh, now what I'll say is that for real disruptions of sun-like stars, the magnetic field strength is a thousand times less than what I had assumed in these initial conditions, because I really wanted to maximize the effect. Um, so really only for very magnetized stars would we expect this to be significant. 
but it is interesting that you can see it quite visibly in the density structure. Uh, all right, so uh, let's talk about energetics. Um, so uh, the important lines to look at here really are the magnetic energy. So this one here is a partial disruption. This one is a full disruption. Uh, and you can see that there is an amplification of the magnetic field in the partial disruption by about a factor of 10. Uh, the field starts to unwind at late times. It's not clear if that's numerical uh, or physical. Yeah. Oh, three minutes. Uh, and uh, <coughs> and uh, that's basically due to those vortices that you saw form shortly after the disruption. That's where most of this amplifi amplification occurs, is when those vortices form. Once the vortices go away and the star settles down, you stop seeing amplification. Uh, in the full disruption case, the magnetic energy uh, has a few blips in it related to the fact that the volume of the star is changing in a sort of complicated way during periapse. And then fascinatingly, you can see the magnetic energy is declining slowly, but not as quickly as the internal energy is. So you can see that if you let this run for infinite time, eventually the total magnetic energy in the stream will be greater than the internal energy of the stream. So that tells you it's going to become magnetically dominated. Now, if you start with a star with a lower magnetic field initially, these curves will be down lower to start with, and it will take a longer amount of time for those two to become comparable to one another. Uh, so we tried a few different configurations and strengths just to see if we can get um, any trends. Uh, these are all partial disruptions. Uh, the dashed lines show a dipolar field configuration initially where we put it, uh, the dipole perpendicular to the orbital plane. Uh, and in all cases, you see sort of a level of 10 amplification of the field. Uh, it also seems like we get a little bit more amplification in the cases where we start with a slightly weaker field to begin with. But it does seem like it's relatively close to uh, converged in the sense that if we increase the field strength, it's not changing the amplification dramatically. My guess would be is that if we went to really extreme fields or you start getting comparable to the magnetic internal energies, that's going to prevent the growth of the field significantly. So uh, it seems like we're getting maybe a factor of 10 increase. Uh, that's interesting, but it's not as interesting as I think it could be, right? We were kind of interested in maybe generating a magnetic star out of nothing. Uh, but it seems like even if we give it a good head start, it doesn't actually get there. Uh, OK, so just briefly, comparing to analogs. People have done simulations of neutron star mergers, white dwarf mergers with magnetic fields in them. Uh, that's basically the closest analog we have to this. This is sort of a star merging with itself. That makes sense. Um, and in those calculations, uh, so this uh, neutron star merger calculation, the amount of amplification that they see there is on the order of 10 to 5, and it's resolution dependent. Uh, so in the white dwarf merger cases, they use a method that does not conserve div B. And if you look here, the magnetic energy goes from 10 to the 24 ergs to 10 to the 47 ergs in their calculation. So it goes up by 23 orders of magnitude. Um, so it's quite a stark difference between the two methods of doing this, and it makes me question a little bit the methods that don't conserve Div B. Okay, I'll skip this. Um, okay. So primary findings are that the magnetic fields basically maintain their original strength in the tidal debris. Uh, eventually, the magnetic energy density can become comparable to the internal energy, which means that it actually could affect the width and the dynamics of the stream. Uh, we start out with a much stronger field than normal. Uh, so you have to keep a, in the back of your head that these kinds of things might happen at later times in real disruptions. Uh, we assumed magnetic geometries uh, sort of arbitrarily uh, and found pretty similar results independent of those geometries that we assumed. Uh, so I just wanted to say that uh, before we actually finalize this, we were working on one double resolution simulation, which you can see in the background here. So each pixel that you see there is an actual voxel in the calculation, so it's very, very high resolution. Unfortunately, NASA Pleiades has been having technical errors the past six months that have, uh, this is the last snapshot I have of that before we, been re we need to restart again. Uh, so if the neutron star calculations that showed a greater increase in amplification as you increase the re resolution are uh, true, we might expect to see that here. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, and I think we need to do a bit more quantitative analysis. We have sort of a basic idea of what it does qualitatively, um, and it seems to make total sense when I explain to you the flux conservation and 
In principle, we didn't need to run a simulation for that. Uh, so we kind of want to get more um, specific numbers for these things I'm describing. So thank you. I don't think so. I don't think we see, if there was reconnection, it would be numerical in the calculation anyway. Um, it, would, it would be sort of when um, two fields of opposite directions, uh, it's, it's physical in the sense that that's what really happens, but the scale that that really happens in reality is much, much smaller than what we can resolve in the simulation. So. in terms of the amount of numerical reconnection? Uh, I don't think so. It does seem like flux freezing is pretty, a pretty good approximation to how the energetics are changing. So for instance, the magnetic energy density seems to go pretty well with the volume of the star. So that suggests that actually the density is not changing dramatically much in response to numerical reconnection effects. Yeah, so I, so what, one thing with the partial disruption cores is that they basically rejoin the Hayashi track in a sense. You're kind of revitalizing the star. You're, tump, you're dumping in a ton of extra energy above and beyond what it has from its own nuclear energy that it produces. So it evolves, I think, very similarly to a star that's going down the Hayashi track. And those stars will start out with strong magnetic fields as well. And I think it'll break in a very similar way to the way those stars do. That's right. It will be at, this, at that point less effective in the because the initial oil will be That's true. There will be some breaking, but it might be reduced relative to a dipolar configuration. I actually don't know for protostars how dipolar the field really is inside of them. Maybe someone else can answer that question. That's right, that's right. So if it's a factor of 10 every time, then if you want to build up three orders of magnitude in strength, you would have three encounters with the black hole to build it up. The, the one thing that makes me worry is that the magnetic energy uh, does have this slow decline at late times. And I think what, what's happening is that you've wound up the field considerably during the disruption, and it's starting to unwind and basically tap into that magnetic energy and sharing it with the um, kinetic energy of the star. So that's, that's basically leading to a slow drainage of the magnetic field in the star. And it's not clear to me if the level of decay that we see is resolution dependent. So we have run one half resolution simulations that look pretty similar to these. So I'm fairly confident that what we see here is physical, but I'm not entirely sure yet. Okay, uh, it works. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, organize, organizers. Uh, thank you, organizers, for.
giving, giving a chance to talk about uh, my recent, recent results here. Um, my name is Kimitake Hayasaki. I'm, I'm purely Japanese, but now I, I'm affiliated with Tsunbuku National University in South Korea. And they are my collaborators. Okay. So this is the outline of my talk. And first, um, I will very brief introduction about tidal disruption events. And then um, uh, I will describe uh, our numerical model and the detail about uh, general relativistic treatment in smooth particle hydrodynamics code. And then um, I'm going to, to explain the three main results. In the final, I'm going to summarize my talk. Okay. So uh, there are three main uh, scientific motivations to study tidal disruption events. Uh, one is uh, tidal disruption events are proof of, probe of uh, supermassive black hole demography. And second, tidal disruption events are laboratory for super Eddington accretion and outflow physics. And, and also, final um, tidal disruption events are one of gravitational wave source candidates. And this is uh, the uh, usual standard picture of tidal disruption event. And star approach uh, to the black hole, and then tidal disrupted at the radius where the uh, black hole tidal force just dominated <laughs> the self-gravity force of the star. And the typical value of tidal disruption radius um, in for 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole and 1 solar mass star is 100 solar radius or uh, 20, 24 super suit radius. And after disruption, um, stellar debris, uh, um, about half of Stellar debris is uh, uh, away from the black hole um, because of a positive energy by tidal disruption. And ab about half, remaining half, fall back to the, to the black hole. And this is a typical time scale of a typical uh, fall back time scale. And there are many uh, numerical simulation study, studies of um, tidal, disruption, uh, tidal disruption events in parabolic orbit. And the problem is uh, how uh, uh, whole back mass finally accrete onto the, the black hole because uh, um, because uh, the, ang the, the angular momentum of stellar debris is uh, conserved, so whole back mass is back to return to the, the tidal disruption radius. That's why we need, we need the mechanism to, 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 to circularize the stellar debris. So, um, but how whole uh, back the mass is circularized, it still remains, still remains um, 
still a matter of debate. Okay. So this is a, 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 a there are two type of um, uh, tidal disruption events depending on the uh, original orbit of of the star, and this is a summary of uh, summary table of uh, two two type of tidal disruption events. Um, so. So one is a parabolic standard PDEs. And here, original stellar orbit is parabolic orbit. And binding a specific energy is zero. And the peak value of mass fallback rate is uh, 10 to the 2 to 3 um, Eddington, Eddington rate. And uh, as you, as you know well, mass fallback rate curve is proportional t to the minus 5 sub. And also the, the number of observed TD candidate or parabolic TD is about 20. And typical fallback time scale of uh, most loosely uh, bound orbit are uh, estimated uh, uh, more than 300. And on the other hand, so in the case of eccentric, uh, exo exotic TDs, the original cell orbit is eccentric, and the peak value of mass fall black rate is uh, two or three orders of magnitude larger than parabolic standard TD case. And mass fallback rate curve is a uh, spiked shape or delta function like shape. And the number of TD, observed TD candidates, uh, it's uh, one. And typical fallback time scale of most loosely, uh, most tightly bound orbit is much shorter than uh, parabolic TD. So uh, the other aspect of eccentric TD is uh, uh, given by, will be given by next speakers, uh, I'm not sure. So uh, look at uh, this value, I mean, typical fallback time scale of most tightly bound orbit of two TDs. So because um, uh, Parabolic um, TD case, uh, even um, the, I mean, even time scale, uh, fallback time scale of most, uh, even most loosely, uh, most tightly uh, bound orbit is uh, more than 300 dynamical time. It, it means um, um, time, uh, simulation time scale is very, very con um, con consuming, very time consuming. And that's why um, eccentric TDEs make it possible to perform, to perform simulations within realistic simulation time scale. So that's why uh, uh, our goal is to study effect of supermassive black hole spin on debris circularization. And this is a, a schematic picture of eccentric TDs. And this is a spinning supermassive black hole here. And so, uh, so this is a tidal disruption radius. And star is here, and the blue curve shows original stellar orbit, original eccentric orbit. And after disruption, uh, stellar debris uh, should be circularized like this. Okay. 
okay so uh, this is uh, the modeling of star black hole system uh, by using SPH code developed by Benz and Bell et al. And uh, we use uh, common parameter. Uh, so this is a black hole mass. Black hole mass is 10 to 6 solar mass. And stellar mass is 1 solar mass. And this is the uh, initial state of density map. And the star, uh, so we put the star here, uh, and, uh, and the black hole is here, and then that the circle shows the tidal disruption radius. And this is a, a extended uh, uh, star, uh, and the initial direction of the star is here. And the star is modeled by a uh, polytropic sphere. And we need to, to, to treat, um, treat uh, we, we need to be careful in treating general, uh, treating the black hole, black hole particle or black hole potential because of general relativistic effect. Um, so there are uh, two types of basic equation. Uh, no, sorry, there are two basic equations in general relativity. Uh, one is Einstein equations. Here, this is uh, uh, co uh, this corresponds to, to the Poisson equation in Newtonian theory. And G mu is Einstein tensor, and the ten T mu is the energy momentum tensor. And this is a geo geodesic equations. And, and this corresponds to the, the, the Newtonian equation of motion in Newtonian theory. And this is a, a acceleration term, and this is a host term. And tau is proper time, and gamma is Christoph's per symbol. And this is a function of metric. So in normal, uh, usual uh, procedure, um, Schwarzschild metric or car metric are uh, derived by um, by solving uh, Einstein field equations, and then substituting these metric into the geodesic equations, we can finally get an equation of motion of a test particle. So similarly, in post-Newtonian approach, um, metric can be expressed by deviations from Minkowski flat space-time metric because of weak gravitational field. And substituting expand, expanded metric into the geodesic equations, we can finally test particle equation motion with, with post-Newtonian corrections like that. And this is a Newtonian term and a 1pn term, and this is a spin induced acceleration term and a 2pn term. So these uh, post Newtonian accelerations are inco incorporated into SPH education motion. So the problem is why, uh, how, how do we treat hydrodynamic term in SPH equation motion? So we can have order of magnitude estimate of each term in fluid equation of motion. And this is uh, th uh, this is the example. So, so this is uh, the uh, order of magnitude of 1 pn gravitational acceleration. And this is a 1 pn pressure term. And this is a 1 pn self-gravitation term. So you can see um, so hydrodynamic and self-gravitational terms can be neglected because uh, much smaller than the 1 pn gravitational acceleration term. So uh, we can justify uh, post Newton acceleration involved in SPH case of motion. Uh, we can justify the 
uh, uh, only inclusion of gravitational acceleration into SPH code uh, is enough to 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 express a um, general relativistic effect in tidal disruption event. Okay. And let's move to the results. So the effect of relative cooling efficiency on this formation. And um, so this is uh, the typical uh, typical value of optical uh, depth and so uh, for electron scatterings and the the value is at, uh, of the order of ten to the six and and this is uh, the the photon diffusion time time scale and and this is a holdback time scale. So, so you can see that the uh, so stellar devil is clearly optically thick for tidal disruption radius scale. Um, so there are two types of uh, uh, radiative, radiative cooling efficiencies by comparison between um, fallback time scale and diffusion time scale. And if holdback time scale is longer than diffusion time scale, Davis orbital energy is converted to thermal energy by shock and radiate away quickly. And if holdback time is shorter than the diffusion time scale, Davis orbital energy is converted, converted to thermal energy by shock and stored into the debris. So because it is uh, uh, not so simple to treat radiative transfer in optical thick regions, so we consider the two extreme cases, one in radiatively efficient cooling case and the other is radiatively inefficient cooling case. So this is an example of radiatively efficient cooling case. So this is the original parameter of uh, uh, orbital parameter of original stellar orbit. And this is a penetrant factor. And this is a black hole spin parameter. The I is an inclination angle between the black hole spin and original uh, orbital uh, uh, and orbital plane of original stellar orbit. And this is a density map animation of a, uh, XY plane. XY plane is the orbital plane and the corresponding ZY plane. And dash line shows the tidal disruption radius. So you can see that formation of geometry carry thin ring like structure. Sorry? Ah, small, small one, uh, small white. Yeah. Ah, this is a velocity vector. Velocity vector of uh, matter. It's a particle. Right. So, so pardon, pardon. Is there fluid still? Is there fluid in the dark blue? Yeah, it's it's free, free. And uh, it's a Berosi vector of fluid fluid part. So this is a radiatively inefficient cooling case. 
So uh, the same simulation, but for relatively inefficient cooling case. So you can see the formation of geometrically thick piece. Okay. And the effect of uh, black hole spin, especially upside precession in this formation. Uh, so uh, this is the test uh, effect of upside precession test particle simulation. The starting point is here. And we'll finish. Finish. Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. Sorry, somebody. <laughs> so, post Newtonian approach is an effective way to study supermassive black hole spin effect on uh, the circularization. And radiative cooling efficiency affects on structure and evolution of debris circulation. Um, oh, okay, so that's all. Thank you. Slow down, please. Yeah. So this is a non-spinning black hole case that yeah. uh, fits particle. Yeah. 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 This one? Yes, oh, yes. This is a mega. Huh? Huh? Two, two more slides. If you go slide forward. Two more? One more. Oh. Okay. Oh, this is a. Uh, sorry. One more? One more? One yeah. more. Yeah. The next yes. Um, okay. Ah, sorry, if she is spent And then the direction of spin is like that. Eccentric parabolic? Uh, that's good. Good question. The m maybe the right curve, the shape of right curve is more rem remark uh, is remarkable difference between parabolic PD yeah, yeah. case. Ob observation rate.